James Murphy uh, is, serves as the U.S. Coast Guard Sector Columbia River Marine Transportation Recovery Unit Coordinator. He is the chair of the Sector Columbia River AMSC Cyber Subcommittee and is the uh, and uh, is the Sector Columbia River representative at federal, state, local, and industry levels for maritime disaster recovery planning and mitigation efforts. Uh, Jim is also a PhD student at the University of Antwerp in Belgium, uh, where he is working on a doctorate in marine, marine transport and economics. He also received his master's in emergency management and homeland security from Arizona State University, which we don't hold hands. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Uh, thanks for coming out to this presentation. I really appreciate it. Um, this one, I got to start with, almost didn't happen. We were about to be uh, furloughed, as you know, a couple of days ago. Um, and I would have been on that list. So I was thinking of ways in which I could uh, still hear the presentation without having to do it in, in, on behalf of Coast Guard. So what you're going to see today is a little bit of a mix of that. So I have some of the Coast Guard stuff. And then what I was going to do was just slap it into a University of Antwerp PowerPoint and give it to you as a doctoral student. Jim. So that would have been the next uh, next kind of work around. So, but what we're going to do is we're going to talk a little bit about what we do with Coast Guard um, in regard to um, MTS, Marine Transportation Systems Cybersecurity, um, how we protect it, some of the whys and things like that. Then we're going to get into some of the differences and some of the issues with um, concerns with cybersecurity in the U.S. and in the EU, and then. If we have enough time today, uh, I'll do a case study of shipyard um, breach that we had here in 2022. Uh, I thought it was kind of just the, uh, the drama session afterwards, right? Like we're going to have all the beauty shop getting our hair done and talking about it. So uh, I think it'll be great. Um, first of all, did anybody come to my presentation last year? Nice, nice. Welcome back, you guys. Good to see you guys. Do we have any students here? Undergrad students? Traditions in the military is going to have a challenge for you. No way. Oh, wow. So, congratulations. Good luck with your career. Keep it going. Nice. So, you guys want to share it. Sorry, guys. I only had two. Awesome. You have to do it just like that. Yep. Awesome. Keep it up. Keep up the good work. I really appreciate you guys coming to this presentation, being interested in your time. So hopefully we show you a little bit too that maritime cybersecurity is a thing. You know, it's a it's a it's a field and it's growing and there's a lot of spot if you're a young person and you're interested. Uh, this is a lot of upward mobility. Okay, so let's talk about Sector Columbia River. Um, so Sector Columbia River is uh, located in Portland, Oregon. Um, it's it overseas where the Columbia and the Willamette Snake MTS are formed by the NAPA. Forces of Columbia, um, along the Snake River, of course. Uh, and it's a vital element of the economic engine of the American Northwest. Uh, we were talking earlier, I didn't put it in the PowerPoint, but we have $24 billion in goods that are exported out of the Columbia Snake system each year. That's part of the reason why we're standing here talking to you about it. We'll get into more of the why in a little bit, especially with the supply chain, but um, those numbers are pretty staggering. A couple other things we didn't put in there, but like the grain that leaves the Columbia system goes to the whole world, we literally feed the world. So we feed, uh, due to USA um, grain agreements and things like that, food agreements, we're, we're sending grain to Yemen, to South Korea, and to some folks that are, that are pretty impoverished in Africa. So um, a grain disruption here, whether it's cyber, whether it's physical, uh, would, would be felt worldwide. Um, it's one of the few port systems in the nation to export more goods than it imports. Um, and it's, of course, the top gateway. For American wheat and barley exports, which is awesome because everybody lives in Mississippi. That's us. So, or sorry, us. <laughs> um, so, it's uh, also an export of corn, bulk mineral, and lumber and paper products. Um, Sector Columbia River also encompasses. I don't know, it's not a good slide here, but so basically within this. Black AOR line, area of responsibility. We have 38 ports. So we have southern Washington, essentially Grace Harbor, down to um, 
Preston City. So we work all that, and we also work 200 miles offshore. And then we work into Idaho, and where we go is the Navajo River, so we the path of the Navajo Waterway, and uh, in the post, of course, we do search and rescue. So just kind of the size of what we work on. Um, okay, so let's get into it. A little bit of Coast Guard stuff. Um, let's talk about the Coast Guard cyber strategy. This was implemented in 2020, so. So, uh, for a while we were running on this without, um, without some guidance, but then we got some. Because as a regulatory authority, which we are, I know the FBI went up there and said we're not a regulatory authority, well, we are. Um, so, we regulate facilities and facility security plans, and cyber strategy is starting to catch up to how that's regulated. So, maritime critical infrastructure in the cyber world is the following right? it's vessels, it's facilities. It's port complexes, intermodal connections, it's bridges, um, other components needed to operate the MTS, the Enterprise Force Marine Transportation System as a whole. Um, and then, of course, we learned this a lot in COVID, but the people who operate these systems and live and recreate with them in the uh, maritime domain. So, when we learned in COVID, was that uh, if you don't have someone, whether they're sick or not, if you don't have someone to drive us out, you have a marine transportation system to start. What's so, an intermodal connection? So intermodal connection is where like a port with a pier meets a rail connection, which then meets a truck destination. Or a rail break, or as sometimes they have an airport. So. Okay, so this is kind of back to the why part. Um, this is the marine transportation system supply chain. Um, so your stuff starts at an overseas factory. It's Truck and rail um, goes to a port where there's cargo handling, security, uh, customs, things like that. And then sometimes it'll go straight to a, a vessel over the waterway. And it's a maritime discussion. We'll just assume that it's for this this one. Uh, and then of course it's going to go back to another port. It's going to go for cargo handling. It's going to go inspection. It's going to be warehousing. It's going to be customs again. Uh, and then it could go anywhere. It could go multimodal transportation, rail, air transport. Um, and then from there, it's going to go to another version of that, delivery trucks, which is you know your Amazon that you see, or your, your UPS or whoever's delivering stuff to you. And then it goes to your, your local electronics store, but even then, that analogy is kind of out of date. I don't know who goes to the electronics store. Um, probably goes right to your doorstep, is what that should say. Um, maybe I'll have another little puzzle piece, but uh, they hit the uh, you know the UPS hub or, or the uh, Amazon Hub or something like that. Um, so but this is the why. And so these goods can be anything, right? We talked about uh, wheat and corn and barley and steel and different things that are and wood that are exported out of our, our region. Um, but we also import some, via ships, we import um, a whole bunch of Subarus, um, or Port of Portland, brings in a bunch. So, you know, they're, they're working on that, which brings another set of risk to it, right? Because now you've got a different type of ship, you've got a different, uh, you know, railroads have different uh, gimbal decks and systems in them, and then you've got now vehicles that've got lithium ion batteries and things like that. And so from a firefighting perspective, we care about that stuff too, not just a uh, sign. But uh, so it makes it more complex. <coughs> so now let's move into at-risk systems in the marine transportation system. Uh, we'll break this up. First, I'll show you what's what some of the systems are on a ship, and then we'll talk about what systems are in. Um, uh, at the pier and kind of how they relate to each other. And for those of you OGs that were here for the last year's one, these will sound familiar, but after that I did change them, so I'm pretty sure. Okay, so essentially what we're looking at, thanks to ABS, we always have really cool graphics and things like this, but these are all the different um, packable systems on a vessel. Um, they're co color coordinated, you know, orange is propulsion, steering, Yellow is navigation, green is power, ballast is bluish, uh, communications is raspberry emissions, cargo is um, blue, cargo management, right? Um, and so it's similar to IT, OT, everywhere else in, in this industry, right? We want to definitely have those two segregated on a ship as well. Because if you've got, there, we have tons of anecdotal accounts, and I can tell you tons of stories about vessels coming in. And they've got this open broadcast AIS 
that runs in your internet as well. And it's set up to just pull up whatever tower is available the second they get as close to that tower as they can. They don't know who else is there, they don't know who else is coming in at the moment. And sometimes I got a guy that was doing that on the way out. He did some banking on his ship's computer. And then when he got to the next port, which was two weeks later, because it had no connectivity at that point, he realized that there was nothing in his camera. So and that's really difficult because it's a foreign national and things like that. So it makes it uh, it makes it really complex. But as far as the ship navigation systems go, right? Like if you get the navigation um, packages, we're talking radars, um, things like that. We work with the Columbia River bar pilots pretty regularly. In fact, they're our first line of defense. If they have any, I guess I don't know. They use their spy senses because these cats have been around for a long time and they know ships and they know when things are weird. So if they get something that looks like some spoofing or they look like something that's not working properly or a radar or uh, some sort of GPS system um, or bridge system is the total word for all those that's not working, they'll reach out and notify us. Sometimes they, you know, they give us a little more info with some stuff that we know about because they think other stuff, but uh, <laughs> well, shoot, look at this cute laughter. But each one of those things is really important, especially like ballast water. If somebody hacks your ballast water on your ship, uh, that's going to uh, alter the vessel stability. So that means your vessel could potentially capsize or it could run aground, things like that. Uh, most of these vessels are running at like 40 feet deep or 40 foot draft is the amount of ship that's under the water. Yeah, but the water depth in the channel is only dredged to 43 feet. So we're talking this much. Energy. A giant 400 foot ship in the bottom group. So, if your ballast is off or someone's messing with it, then it's a significant problem. The cargo management, of course, too. We talked about that with the railroads, like I mentioned. You know, if, uh, if they're not, if they're not uh, stacked appropriately and the weight's in the right spot and not in conjunction with ballast, then they're, the ship's not going to run really well. If you get somebody that happens to be a little savvy on the ship, it's going to want to. So now let's talk about how this is all the things that would connect. So say you have something that's um, one of these bridge systems has been contracted somehow. Well, the second it gets to ship or to the pier, it's going to plug in. And so what we're looking at now is all the different things that could be affected because that ship is plugged into the system. So it supports electricity, and internet, right? Gate and access controls, cranes, lighthouse controls, security cameras, um, rail, pipelines, trucks, electronic signs, because there's a whole lot of signs on those shipyards to tell the truck where to go and what the flow of traffic is and things like that. Um, cargo manifest, if that gets gummed up, that's gonna go up the whole works. So there's more ships that are coming into that parking spot uh, after this one. If this one has to be delayed, it's gonna cost them upwards $10,000 extra an hour for how long they're there. So uh, it's, it's, a, it's a costly, costly mistake to allow your system to be, to be hit like this. Um, of course, vessel electricity and internet, and then steering and communication. And that's the big plus. Right? If somebody missed it, you're steering. That's a big problem. Okay, so let's talk about, now we're gonna shift a little bit into um, this is like maritime cybersecurity workforce concerns, kind of the trends on where we've been going, and then I'll rotate it in. This is the first time I've presented it, so bear with me a little bit. It's kind of a dry run on this session, but I think um, it could be kind of interesting, and then we can compare it with the EU, see what uh, what they think about it, and also their perspectives slightly different, so it'll be neat to see it. Um, so basically, the shortage of the qualified cybersecurity professionals, you know, it's, it's a concern. Um, the rise of nation state threats and bad actors, they all want to make money um, by holding electricity, gas, pipeline, and maritime domain operations hostage for financial gain. Uh, that means the labor shortage is becoming even more important because of this. Um, so it has more the U.S., uh, according to uh, 1898 company out of Houston, their, this is their, their data, um, has about 950,000 um, workers. And uh, there were about 714,548 jobs posted online, uh, representing many jobs all through the workforce. Um, and then the uh, 
worldwide, so this is the U.S.'s take on worldwide, is that it's increased from 1 million to 3 million between 2013 and 2020. I would have put this in a Google graph if it didn't happen, so sorry. Um, and so, so these are just some more, this is kind of a big graph format. I've pulled these from a couple of different sources. But they're just really interesting to see the type of jobs, uh, the job openings, uh, employed cybersecurity workforce in the U.S. And this sometimes doesn't account for maritime, right? So this is just cybersecurity workforce throughout the entire uh, spectrum. Um, yeah, if you need to. It's interesting too when you compare this to the European side, what the job titles are, right? They, they, they carry that stack. Most likely, we're an engineer or an analyst. Um, network engineering and architecture similar. Okay, so we're going to get into maritime cybersecurity workforce concerns um, for the EU. So, new research published by DMV in 2023 reveals that less than half, or 40%, of maritime professionals. The European Union think their organization is investing enough in cybersecurity at a time when vessels and other critical infrastructure are becoming increasingly networked um, and connected to IT systems. So it's worth noting too when you look at how they published their research for this company uh, versus how a lot of the US companies did it. Um, these folks polled their own industry to get their pulse of it, right? Whereas the US data comes out in um, kind of this is just the data. There's no poll, there's no kind of theme to it at all. You see that? So they did a poll on talent and budget that are, are the top barriers, right? Um, but the question they asked was one of the biggest challenges when it comes to enhancing your OT cybersecurity um, up to the slide, slide to three, right? And um, you know, no surprise. Um, the, the lowest was uh, that no one has ever experienced anything. I should probably be real. If you're in cyber and you haven't experienced any incidents yet, then I don't know, it's really, really, really good or nothing's plugged in. Like, <laughs> 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 right, well, there's, I don't know, some you're cool drop math. <laughs> um, so, this is, uh, I just thought this was really interesting. Kind of need to see where. Where your things they're going. Um, and what we'll do is we'll move into regulatory stuff. Um, so they also felt insufficient, fun insufficient funding is their maritime sector's biggest barrier to cyber resilience. Um, and then tighten, they, their conclusion was tightening regulation raises the hopes for greater investment in cybersecurity. Um, they've done that first, the EU recently. Uh, in the maritime sector, started implementing tighter cybersecurity regulations to the point where they would find vessel owners, operators, and agents, and things like that, if they were outside the compliance. But as the Coast Guard, we're not there yet. We've we've got we've got the regulation in place. We've got all of the different systems in place, and we're building them up. And we're working with our partners to to engage them and to talk about facility security plans and how the cyber management works within all those. Um, but we're we probably could under our existing authorities, but uh, we just haven't gotten to the spot where we're going to uh, you know, punitively um, uh, you know, discipline someone because of something that they did. Um, in fact, we're, we'll get to this, I don't know if I actually heard of this, but we have something called the Cyber Protection Team, which is a deployable unit that the Coast Guard has. So if a maritime entity is, has a hack, they can call us, we'll work through it, we'll get that, these folks online. And they actually come out and, and attack it right there. They also do like a and threat and assess missions that will that kind of proactively as well. Um, they're usually one week or so they're remote, and then another week they're in your in your system. And that's that's uh, back to the chast thing from earlier. It's a uh, three, <laughs> and uh, um, it's a uh, but uh, uh, they will ask to get into some stuff, right? So it's like we're on the door. door. So you're going to have to be kind of comfortable with the things that you're letting them look at and things like that. You'll all sign a confidentiality agreement and things like that. So uh, we call it rules of engagement. 
can just decide what also you assign, assign one of those and figure out what cyber protection team is doing and what they're doing. Right? Um, how that relates to regulation, that's, uh, that's going to be an interesting, interesting talk as we progress as a service and how we're going to regulate cybersecurity. Whether we regulate them outside of uh, facility security plan cyber actions or not, that's it's going to be interesting. So here's the U, U, uh, EU's take on um, stronger regulation. You can probably just get rid of the stuff on the side. That's just word salad. Whatever slide, sorry. Um, but this was really interesting because of all the different um, factors that they felt go into. Regulation and things like that. And I know we have a lot of them, right? Like geopolitical volatility. Um, and then the main thing that I'm finding as being a student in Europe at the moment is that most of the European agencies in the maritime are looking to decarbonize, right? Decarbonizing shipping is a massive, massive thing for them. It's not something that's we're working on really here very much. But even their cyber um, focuses are on decarbonization. So they want their cyber um, hygiene to be appropriate enough so that they can work their decarbonization goals. Um, we're in the US, we're not quite working there because our ports aren't as, uh, there's only a few big ones. So the vessels are always going to go there anyway, so there's a bit of a leverage, a leverage thing. Um, so, uh, but a lot of it's the same, you know, a lot of procurement, things like that. So what's, so what's their solution for the fourth goal? To contract that out? I mean, if, if the skill sets aren't in and out. Procurement systems or just 30%? 44% say regulatory compliance. So they have to be compliant. Right. Requires technical knowledge that their organization does not possess in and out. Right. I think you just discovered the vulnerability that they've got. Yeah. yeah. In, their, in their thoughts. So they, they're required it, they're looking for it, they don't have it. I think that this is, but also their perspective is that they've interviewed their own community about it. You know, so I don't know whether there's any um, biases in the data um, or, or not, right? So rather than just crunching numbers and looking at straight statistics, uh, I think there's kind of a bit of a bias in that. And this is just my opinion, this is my bias. Um, but I think the decarbonization thing sometimes um, keeps the Europeans in one lane when other things are kind of going on. So, um, but that's the goal, right? So, um, so this group, uh, DMV, uh, out of Europe, uh, these their recommended actions for European maritime cyber stakeholders, right? Consider cybersecurity as an enabler, treat cybersecurity risks like safety risks and operational setting champion. Insight sharing across the industry, uh, reframe regulation as a baseline and improve cybersecurity posture. Um, I like that one the most because it's more, uh, if we think about reframing regulation within the Coast Guard, that's like a monumental process, right? You have to, you have to go through that. So um, maybe they've got lobbyists in the EU and things like that, but it's a really interesting concept to, that that comes up where we would try to figure out how to just work with regulation or by the way. Loophole around the regulation. Um, we think how to manage supply chain vulnerabilities, uh, resource strategies, of course, and then um, maintain fallback options. Um, in the ship. So, I threw that one in there just because it kind of shows you what the way they're thinking in regards to their solution for uh, maritime cybersecurity. And this came out in the maritime cybersecurity priorities. So when we look at both the EU and the, and the US and some of the concerns that each continent has, some of the, these kind of represent the, um, uh, the, the connectivity of all of it, right? Some of them are similar, things like that. So, you know, I have three things, three to the baseline, deep in stakeholder awareness, and then collaborate with cyber risk. I think all of us sitting here kind of get a lot of these. I think that this is, what they're going for as well. Um, and then under the raise the baseline, you know, you drive forward sector specific and implementable cybersecurity framework. Um, 
We, we didn't define the threat matrix of real-time cyber incidents. Um, a global clearinghouse for MTS intelligence, which we started, right? MTS, ISAC, and the FBI are all involved. Um, but that's one thing, you can actually join their group to do cybersecurity intelligence sharing. Um, it's a fee, though, so you'd be a member for that. Uh, transparent vulnerability disclosure policy. Um, and then under deep, deep in stakeholder awareness, expand cross-sector collaboration through academia, industry, and governments. We get that one here, you can check out. Um, apply maritime cyber education and certification, or certifications, right? That's a really interesting topic. Um, so, you know, don't we really need to do a maritime cybersecurity certificate? You know, it'd be great for folks that are in the industry to come back, get another, something else that they can use to advance in their career, or if you're a young person and you have a computer science degree, you'd like to specialize with it, that might be a great way to do it without um, you know, committing to a full master's program or something like that. Um, MTS stocks, addressing the resource question, right? Resources are a massive problem, everywhere we go, everything that we deal with, um, whether it's a disruption, whether we have cranes to pull things out of the water, or we have um, cyber professionals that can actually help restore systems. Um, so collaborate on cyber risks. Um, so move past the guns, gates, and guards towards cyber risk assessment. I mentioned that, I heard that earlier, um, with you know, what I think is physical and some of the IoT things and cameras, and uh, you've got to kind of you know, get past that. Be great. Um, and then another big one is make cybersecurity a core component of conventional real-time insurance. I know it's different to different spots. Maritime insurance works, but uh, it's uh, something that's good. Um, simulate for cyber challenges. I sat in a discussion earlier about exercises. So, um, absolutely. By the way, my favorite place to put the cyber group in the ICS structure is in the app section. Um, and then just push it toward more secure building. And then what the Coast are doing about this. Figure out there. So we've just established a new cyber mission specialist enlisted rating. Um, it's another career opportunity for folks that would like to go enlisted. If you are of age um, and you would like to enlist in the Coast Guard to be a cyber mission specialist, um, feel free to contact a recruiter. You can, I'll give you a card. You can call me, and I'll send you their thing. But they're just willing to fill out their their deal. If you're interested, if you have a degree and you're just as interested in becoming an officer versus enlisted. Uh, they're starting to work those folks as well. They were starting to get uh, officer specialty programs that are specifically cyber targeted. Because right now, officers in the Coast Guard move around a lot. They do a lot of different things. However, these officers in the cyber community are going to stay the Coast Guard. So they're going to stay there most of their whole career, uh, which is you know, it's a big difference. It's a different way than doing business that we've done. Uh, and I've been around the Coast Guard for a long time, and we get a lot of things right, and we fumble a lot of things right. But one, thing, one of the things that we're doing really well is getting a hold of how we regulate cybersecurity and then how we're going to support it. And by bringing up new rates, bringing up new warrant officers, bringing up new line officers, right, it's really, really a cool thing. It's going to add a lot of capabilities to every sector in the Coast Guard. Um, where am I at time? Is that it? Okay, we'll have to talk about the case study in the shipyard next time. So, I always leave with this. Um, if you have any cyber incidents in the marine transportation system, if it's a marine, trans marine transportation system, um, or NHTSA regulated facility, call the NRC. If you're a non NHTSA regulated facility, please call Site Columbia River Command Center, uh, and then we will make the proper notifications. And if you've got any questions, feel free to reach out, and we'll be happy to, uh, to discuss. Thanks so much.